Hello and welcome to the Haskell Weekly Podcast. As you might have guessed, this show is about Haskell, which is a purely functional programming language. I'm your host, Cameron Guerra, and I'm an engineer here at IT Pro TV. And I'm Andres Schmois. I'm also an engineer in IT Pro TV. It's, uh, excited to have you on, on the show today, man. How are you doing? Doing good. I've been here a few times now, and it's pretty good to be here. Yeah, it's pretty fun, huh? Get to hang out, talk about Haskell, be nerds. It's always a good time. Yep. Uh, well, guys, uh, today we're actually going to be talking about a article called Practical Profuncter Lenses and Optics in PureScript. And yes, we know this is PureScript, uh, but we just thought the, the topic was good. Um, and this article is also written by Thomas Honeyman, and it can be found in issue 172 of Haskell Weekly. So uh, if you want, go check that out because uh, it's a pretty good article. All right, Andres, well, we're talking about you know lenses and optics. Um, in, in your experience, what is that? So... I've been here for about three months now, and that's pretty much how long I've been doing Haskell. And my question is, exactly what do we use lenses for, and why do we need them? Yeah, so that's a that's a great question. Um, and and my professional experience, which isn't much more than yours, maybe you know another year or so. Um, the the experience I've had with it is you know getting into to nested objects um, and seeing really what nested data structures have in store, um, and then actually being able to mutate them, um, which in my most experience being in JavaScript, you know, I have this like fear of mutation is evil, uh, but Haskell has lenses which allow mutation, um, with, and, you know, and, and the other optics as well, which is prisms, traver uh, traversals, and ISOs, um, which they're all kind of cool. Um, and I definitely think, you know, this article, you know, talks a lot about all of them, uh, but I, I definitely want us to stick to lenses. So um, we've used lenses a lot here at IT Pro for XML mostly. Uh, there's another library we use uh, that helps us with our AWS integration called Amazonka that also uses lenses. But yeah, we, we use that because the data structures can be pretty hairy. Uh, things are pretty uh, hard to get into the nested objects of XML. It, you know, so what, what's your experience with dealing with XML in other languages? So um, coming from an imperative background in uh, JavaScript and Java and specifically Android, XML is something that is it's a red herring. Uh, things that every single programming language have tried to solve. And it seems like for every single implementation that I've seen of parsing this, it is super complicated. Uh, especially so on languages like Android where when I first started, didn't have it at all. And the uh, the internal implementations for XML were not allowed to be used in the Android library. So it became this thing that would be really difficult to use. Um, so it was very interesting to come to Haskell and start to see how we handled XML, especially as a you know backend server side language for Haskell. And it seems like it's complicated but it also seems like it's doable. It's not a thing that is almost impossible or you'll have to write your own parsing and you know have to deal with everything that comes with parsing. So with, to me, lenses have been interesting because it's a complicated solution to a complicated problem. Yeah, and it does add you know another level of mental complexity to learning Haskell, right? It's just not the syntax. It's not, you know, it's another level of, you know, oh, this is a possibility in Haskell. The other thing is it is possible to parse XML and things like that without lenses. Um, and we've done it here at IT Pro TV. And it's, uh, needless to say, rough, <laughs> um, you know, trying to filter out exactly what you need out of every element um, and all the nodes and the children elements, that kind of things. Um, whereas XML, um, or sorry, excuse me, using lenses, um, in you know to parse the XML allows us to get out specific values um, without having to know what else is in the XML, um, which is helpful uh, because we don't have to filter out things we don't need or filter things we do need. So lenses allowed us to get you know the deeper nested objects, which is great. Um, you know, and it, without all the boilerplate, um, have you kind of experienced anywhere where you're dealing with nested objects that you felt like? lenses could have maybe helped with producing boilerplate? So that's actually the point that um, we were discussing way before we even came into um, this article, which was 
why even use lenses? Um, we have all of these solutions available to us. Why use lenses? So coming back to the, the parsing of JSON, one thing that came to mind was we use the ASON library to parse JSON just because that's what I was told to use. And it seems like it was, it, it is a very good way to parse JSON. There is one and only one downside that I've seen so far, and it's been sort of nagging at me, and that is the fact that it's got a lot of boilerplate to be able to parse all of this JSON that is coming into your server. Mm -hmm. And one of the worst offenders of it are very nested objects. To be able to use JSON in a manner that um, isn't required to do any kind of fancy parsing you'll need to set up a data structure with an instance for every single level of your JSON object. Not 100% sure, but I think with lenses, if you didn't care for this structure that was already there, so let's say that you're hitting a third-party library and you just cared about one thing inside a nested object, I could see lenses being useful in removing a lot of that boilerplate code. Mm -hmm. My question is, is it worth it? Is the complexity trade-off versus the boilerplate trade-off worth it and with haskell from what i've seen so far haskell is very concise it's a, it's a language that allows you to write things in a very concise manner mm -hmm. lenses is just another extension of this right it's a little a little more complex but um you know it's yeah it's definitely the question of when to use lenses versus when not to first for the complexity aspect uh and I think, you know, something we talked about earlier was, like you said, we don't use lenses for JSON, but we do for XML. And I think with JSON, there's there's a little more types there, right? There's a little, you know, inherently it's a little easier to understand. You could take a JSON file and look at it and understand what is what. Um, where you, sometimes you pull out an XML file and you're like, wait a second, what's going on here? Um, and so I, I think the reason there, that complexity lives for XML is because it, to, it's a confusing data structure as it is. It's great. It does, you know, it's effective, but it's a, it's confusing and hard to read from a visual, you know, a visual perspective. And, you know, the it kind of reflects in the code, right? That's kind of crazy, huh? Definitely. And if you think about it, XML specifically doesn't have any kind of data structure things that people are normally used to seeing in code because of the fact that it in it and of itself is a sort of, uh, you know, DOM language. So it's a, it's got a document and it's got a whole bunch of different tags and values and they don't necessarily need to mean anything. They are just there. Mm -hmm. And, you know, HTML is XML. It's just a different, it's a, it's a different subset of it. So if you look into XML, XML isn't a data structure that is easily parsable by anything. With mm -hmm. JSON, from what I've, you know, uh, discovered, it was meant to be a or it is a replacement for XML to be more towards transferring of information simpler. Mm -hmm. And I think that's why going back to the whole complexity issue, we have a complicated problem for a complicated uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> we have a complicated solution for a complicated problem. Mm -hmm. And that is my experience with this. Right. And and we we're talking too more about, you know, some of the the fundamental aspects of lenses, right? And we touched on it a lot earlier about the mutability. And with XML, you know, we want to be able to reach into an object, and if we're going to change it, you not have to parse everything else around it, but just change that one aspect, right? Um, because it could get complicated. Yeah. Um, whereas Java, you know, JSON, sorry, uh, we're going to be you know wanting to we could just make a whole new object and deal with it, you know, because it's it's easy to kind of just create. And I think Haskell. Definitely, you know, I think most programming languages are much more friendly to JSON than they ever will be to XML. So, daggum complicated problem. Yep. Luckily, we have the complicated solution. Um, but I wanted to kind of talk a little bit about, you know, lenses and get back more to the focus, not the JSON versus XML thing, because that's, you know, this is kind of our context in which we view it. And we understand lenses can be, you know, used in many aspects. Um, and we're just kind of speaking from personal experience here. Um but yeah, like the, the ability, um, you know, lenses specifically have to, you know, they can view something. So the, 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 there's like three functions that are pretty critical to, um, you know, lenses and are really the only ones that can be used are 
view, set, and over. So view is a get function, right? Let's get it out. Set is the, the, the function that's able to mutate it, which is setting the value. Um, and we also have over, which is kind of like a map. So it's saying, you know, we're going to modify this value in this lens with a function. And here's the function that take, you know, give, takes that value and gives you back the same value modified, um, which is, you know, helpful that lenses has that built in, which, you know, you would think it, it, it definitely should considering we're in Haskell. And, um, and so that was something that was, you know, interesting for me to see and understand and get a comprehension on is, you know, what are the accessor functions? What do I do with lenses? How do I make a lens that, that even the constructors, I don't super, I haven't spent a ton of time dealing with because, you know, the libraries we have have easy ways to construct a new lens or, you know, whatever. Um, and so, yeah, I just thought that, you know, these functions at the core are pretty easy to understand. But I think people can also get a little bit confused about how they're operating, right? Because we're operating within this optic, this lens, which I think for some people is a little more confusing. Where JavaScript, you're just like, yeah, hey, here's this value. I found it. I have access to it. Okay, just change it to this. Haskell still kind of says, hey, hold on. We're going to make it a little bit more difficult for you to mutate something. But here's what you can do, um, which I think is, you know, it's, it's nice because Haskell says, Okay, like, and that, you know, obviously this article we're reading is in PureScript, so I'm just pulling it over to Haskell because we're talking, you know, this is a Haskell podcast. So, um, like, I think it's very much, it's like a, yeah, you know, I guess it's just a necessary means to uh, solve this really deep nested object issue. I totally agree with the whole lens aspect of these things. This is just an optic. This is not a mutation. Now. What I mean by that is Haskell's entire paradigm is please don't mutate my things. So lenses give you an option to go in there and mutate it in such a way that makes sense to Haskell, which, you know, when you start thinking about what a mutation is, it makes sense that really you Haskell is mutating and it's probably mutating a lot of stuff in the background. I don't know much. Like I said, just started three months ago, uh, but I'm assuming that Haskell's functional paradigm is on the front side, but it obviously will have to have some kind of state in the background. And lenses will give you a view into this uh, mutations. I'm not entirely sure that's where the name comes from. Probably not. But mm -hmm. that's how I see it. And leading into this, I have the question that has been a little nagging. And lenses aren't just for these types of data structures that have come from like JSON or XML or any kind of uh, server thing. The lenses are used for arrays, for lists, for maps, any kind of data structure that you can think of can be used through a lens. Mm -hmm. And my question to you is, would you use lenses in that scenario? Yeah, that's a great question. And I think it would boil down to, you know, do I want to, like, if I'm going to modify something, is it worth it to make a new one? or just modify that single value. And most of the time, you know, we, we choose make a new one, right? Brand new, yeah. The old one, goodbye, see you later. Um, but if we have a huge data structure that we don't want to continually load into memory or be passing around, maybe it is easier to say, hey, let's just use a lens and modify those values along the way and keep the same thing. So um, I definitely say Haskell, the community of Haskell also, we lean a lot more towards make a new one rather than modify a value. Right. Um, but yeah, lenses give you that option. And I think that goes in line to what my thought process was, which is if you don't think you need it, or even if you think you might need it, don't use lenses until you're sure that lenses become a necessity. Right. Like I would definitely not lean towards, yeah, if you want to go, go ahead and make your whole architecture using lenses because, you know, it will work and it, would be fine, um, but it's just going to add a lot of complexity um, yeah. in areas you may not always need that complexity. I agree. Yeah, and um, one thing to note here, um, just a little side note, as I was just looking at this one little thing we had highlighted here. Um, you know, a key difference with the lens specific, um, you know, optic is the value has to be known or like has to be known to exist, I should say. Um, whereas, you know, prisms or traversals or ISOs, 
that's not true. Um, you know, prisms are you know can kind of can think of it as maybe or the either monads and you know dealing with the maybe in either monads and you know uh, traversals thinking more like lists and arrays and you know maps things like that um and so that's something to be, to note is you know you want to make sure if you're going to use a lens you know these are values you want to make sure are there um if not you probably want to look more into like a prism and say hey does this thing exist before i try to go get it um and you know that would like you know prisms allow have something called preview which is like hey go see if this is there if not let's let's bail um so that you know that's another thing to think about if you're you know, using lenses is you know the value has to be there and exist um, or else you could probably get some some gnarly runtime errors yep and i think my takeaway from this talk is lenses are complicated i will probably only reach for them for problems that are complicated not for simple problems mm -hmm. and that is something that in the last three months that's exactly what i've seen so far is the only time we've ever used lenses in our environment is to solve a complicated problem more spe more specifically to us xml and i that is my takeaway from this i am open to finding out that lenses are a lot more powerful and a lot more structured way of doing something it's just I haven't come across it yet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's totally fair. And you know, if you're you know beginning Haskell, I would definitely out there. I would say, hey, like slow down on lenses. Like they they're not a core component necessarily. You know, you'll run into libraries you use that may have lenses. Um, you know, for us, we have Amazonka, which is our AWS um, library, and then we have text.xml.lenses is also a big thing. So core components do have lenses and you can use and solve problems with lenses but i would definitely say let's not you know just because that added complexity could you know just kind of demotivate you um, from solving the problem okay. um, because haskell you know that's what one thing i love about haskell is there's a ton of ways to solve a problem you know yeah the more complicated problems there's less options for beginners out there don't be don't be afraid of lenses but i wouldn't go chasing them you know you know don't go chasing waterfalls. Stick to the rivers and lakes that you're used to. You know, we've got, you know, record syntax. We've got, you know, instances. We've got type classes, things like that that can kind of bypass the whole need for lenses. So definitely uh, feel better about that. So, Andres, do you have anything else you want to kind of touch on um, in regards to specifically lenses? No, I think we, we covered everything. I enjoyed our little talk about lenses. Yeah, I think it was good. Um, and, you know, I think, there's definitely more out there, so definitely check out the article uh, because it's super. You know, it was pretty informative because um, I I hadn't really spent time looking at lenses, lenses in depth um, or prisms or traversals or ISOs. So um, it definitely was pretty informative to me. Uh, I definitely you know encourage our readers to go out there and check it out. But thanks for being on the show with me today, Andres. Thank you for having me, Cam. And thank you for listening to the Haskell Weekly podcast. If you like what you heard, find out more on our website, haskellweekly.news. Also, please rate us and review us on iTunes. It helps a lot. Haskell Weekly is brought to you by IT Pro TV, the tech skills development platform for IT professionals. And also our employers. Yeah, that too. Send your sysadmins and network admins to www.itpro.tv for all your training needs. And then they can tell you what they think of the people who develop it. Yeah, thanks again for being on the show. Uh, we'll see you again next week. See ya. Bye.